Welcome to Atmosphere Live and happy Easter. From all of us here at Atmosphere Church, we're so glad that you've joined us. We pray that this message will touch your heart and that the power of God will change your life. Our desire is to help you connect with God by following Jesus. If you want to find out more about us, head on over to our website at atmosphere.church and you can click below and like and subscribe. Thanks so much for joining us. Let me tell you a story. You may not believe me. I barely believe it myself. But I can't dispute what my soul knows. Peter! John! It's all true. Come see this! Everything he said. The tomb! Every impossible detail. It's empty! It's all true. Shame is a prison as cruel as a grave. Shame is a robber and he's come to take my name. Love is my redeemer, lifting me up from the ground. Love is the power where my freedom song is found. There ain't no grave.
What's up guys, Pastor Jim Cruz here, lead pastor of Atmosphere Church and welcome to Easter Sunday online. We really felt a prompting that we wanted to do a special service just for our online fam. And let's get things started off right by you that are watching on YouTube or Facebook, drop us a comment right now. Just type out where you're watching from and let us know how excited you are that the tomb is empty and Jesus is alive. And that is so exciting. Well, because we are doing the special online gathering just for you guys, we are here today at the Ojai Cemetery. And I think it's a real symbolic place to record and, and have this online gathering because Easter Sunday is about the resurrection of Jesus and it's also about the day that death died. No longer does death have the grip and the hold that it once had in this world. That death and that grip that, that death had is no longer there. Jesus canceled it. That's right. God is the originator of the cancel culture. And I've got so much to tell you today and we're gonna get into a passage from the New Testament. It's gonna be found in 1 Corinthians 15. If you wanna follow along, get your Bibles out. And maybe you're watching for the first time, maybe a friend or a family member said, hey, it's Easter Sunday, tune in online, get a hold of your faith. We are so grateful that you've tuned in and you're our guest today. And I really believe that today's talk is gonna speak directly to where you're at, even if you're not a follower of Jesus. Maybe you've never even opened a Bible one time in your life. I believe that today, God is gonna speak to your life and you're gonna know it. So let me start things off by praying this prayer. Father, thank you for each and every person that is tuned in, that is a part of our online church fam. God, we're so grateful, God, for technology that we can come together from all kinds of different places, literally from all over the world. And I pray today that you would move in this talk 
and touch every single heart of every person that is listening in. God, that they would know that you're real, that they would know that you're alive and that you're up to something powerful for their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, Easter Sunday is obviously a special day for Christianity. And without the resurrection, there really wouldn't be Christianity. But I think in our short time as a church, you know, we have four Easter. This is our fourth Easter as a church family. The first Easter was crazy. It was so fun. Uh, we like to do things out of the box. So our in-person gathering, we decided that we were going to have a, pun, a bunny petting zoo. And so we brought these bunnies from this lady that, I mean, they weren't just bunnies to this lady. They were her kids. And we were meeting at the golf course and the place that we decided to set up the bunny petting zoo, it had like this railing and it went down. So like it was like on the second story of this deck that went down below it. Well, a five-year-old wasn't really holding the bunny tightly and the bunny dove out of the five-year-old's hand and, and didn't just fall. It, it fell over the railing and went all the way down to the bottom. Like the, the bunny fell two stories and the bunny was laying lifeless. The kids were crying. The moms didn't know what to do. The, the lady was hysterical that you know brought the bunnies and she ran down there with one of our workers. We prayed for that bunny. And I, and I want to tell you that the bunny survived the fall. And... I mean, I was just ecstatic that we actually resurrected the Easter bunny on Easter Sunday. <laughs> At least that's what I claim. Uh, but, you know, it's, it, it's so special for me to be able to, to talk to you about this today because death is everywhere around our lives. And if you live long enough, I'm sure you've been to a funeral. I'm sure you've been to a, a place where um, you've had to... Uh, unfortunately say goodbye to a loved one. Um, today, I hold in my hand a Bible that belonged to my sister, Charlene. And this year, 40 years ago, she passed away tragically at the age of 19. I was only 10 years old at the time. And even though I was a child, it was so traumatic for our family that I vividly remember certain parts of this whole experience, um, sad, grieving, the funeral, the family coming over, uh, and, and not knowing how to process this as a 10 year old. And what's special to me is, uh, we were helping my brother and I were helping my dad move some things around his house this last month. And my brother said, Hey, I found Charlene's Bible. And I said, wow. And he said, there's some things written in it. And I, and I think you should check it out. So I went and I grabbed the Bible and, and I read some of these things that my sister Charlene had written down. And it says here, first thing I read, it says, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior on September 23rd, 1980, two years before she passed. And that just meant the world to me. I already knew she was in heaven. I already knew she had a relationship with God. But just reading that from her own handwriting was so special to me. It also says in here that she took notes about the, the proof of the second coming by Pastor Chuck Smith uh, at the Civic Auditorium. And for those of you that aren't familiar with Pastor Chuck Smith, he led the Calvary Chapel movement that's still very much alive and active today uh, around the nation or around the world for that matter. But as I think about my own sister's passing uh, that was 40 years ago, I, I think of the fact that my sister isn't dead. My sister is very much alive. And I would even add that she's more alive now than she was before she passed from this world in 1982. And, and that's what the resurrection of Jesus is all about. This isn't just some historical event that happened in this world. And it is a pivotal historical event. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it was so pivotal that it changed BC into AD. Our whole calendaring system is built around this event that took place so many thousands of years ago. But it's more than a historical event. The resurrection of Jesus is an invitation into a new way of being human. 
into a new way called eternal life. And that's what I want to talk to you about. So in the letter that Paul writes to the Corinthian church, chapter 15, it it talks about this idea of resurrection. And what's so fascinating to me, Bible scholars and historians believe the letter that Paul writes to the Corinthian church is one of the earliest manuscripts written in the New Testament for for us as we're reading this thing. It's dated at 50 AD, so the closest that you could get to the actual event of the resurrection. So I'm going to read to you from 1 Corinthians 15. So Paul, who is transformed by Christ, is writing to the Corinthians about the significance of the resurrection. So starting off at verse 1, it says, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I have received, I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, which we know as Peter, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living. So when he writes this letter to the Corinthian church, many people that experience this are still alive. They're probably in the the crowd going, yep, yep, I saw him with my own eyes. It says, though they some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. (laughs) Doesn't that describe so many of us? I'm one abnormally born. He spends the whole chapter basically verifying and uh, validating the proof of the resurrection. And then if you remove the resurrection, he says, Our lives and everything that we went through are in vain and and our lives are to be pitied. That's, That's what he says. But then he ends the chapter by saying this in verse 51. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed, for the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with the immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Man, what a powerful chapter. And I can't think of a better chapter outside of the event itself in the Gospels to talk about the resurrection. That this is an invitation for all of us to come into this new way of life that is a powerful way of life that not only puts you in a position to enter into heaven when you leave this earth, but greater than that, it puts you in a position to actually experience the life God has always wanted you to experience. I love how in the book of 2 Timothy, Uh, Paul is is talking about this idea of death being canceled. He says, now with the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, he says, he has revealed it. Christ has destroyed or canceled death. And through the good news, he has brought eternal life into full view. Into full view. I'm thinking of this idea that he writes to the Philippian church. I mean, Paul is... Like everything that Paul is doing is centered around the resurrection. And this is why this date is such a big deal for Christians. This is why so many people, even if they only come to church a couple of times of the year, they circle Easter Sunday as the day they come to church. Why? Because without it, it's all in vain. It's all foolish. We are all to be pitied. And in Philippians, he writes this, he says in chapter three, he says, all I want, this is Paul writing to the Philippian church and he's in jail, mind you. 
He's, he's incarcerated because he's so vocal about his faith in Jesus. He says, all I want is to know Christ and to experience the power of his resurrection. In the Greek language, that word is dunamis. And we've been talking about that at Atmosphere over the last month in a series that we called a- Activate. And it's all about the power. He's saying, I want to know God and the power of the resurrection. Paul understands this isn't just some event that buys us a ticket into heaven. This is an event that is an invitation into a new way of living. Now, I know some of you right now, because we're living in the day and age of intellectualism, and some of you want to dismiss me and say, ah, oh, there he goes again, talking about some kind of you know, weird, magical thing where the grave has been emptied and Jesus no longer is in it. I, I will tell you, it's funny to me that historians, scholars that aren't even Christian, do not dispute the, uh, the, the whole existence of Jesus. Like nobody disputes that. H- history shows us that there was a man named Jesus. The dispute, I believe, is in the claim of Jesus, that he is the only way to God. That's where people get a little uncomfortable. But, you know, academia kind of pushes this away. It's like, ah, here you guys go with your fairy tales again. Okay, let's be real. Let's talk. If you live long enough, you're going to run up against things that just don't make any sense. And all you have to do to verify this is go to Netflix, go to YouTube, and go watch all of these specials that are on paranormal activity, things that don't make any sense whatsoever. And, and you will find there's things that happen in this world, no matter how many digits or letters are behind your name, that you're just gonna be like, yeah, I, I know, like that doesn't make any sense. A mystery, if you wanna call it that. It happens to all of our lives. I think about my life, if you remove God from the equation, there's so much. I would argue that most of my life doesn't make any sense. I made a decision a long time ago to follow Jesus and to do the things that he was speaking for me to do. You might call it obedience or whatever, but I did it and things would work out and people would come alongside me and go, wow. And there's a wow factor of unexplainable things that take place when you're li- uh, in your life when you begin following Jesus and doing the things that he's called you to do with your life. Now, as I think about the power of the resurrection that Paul was just writing here saying, I, I, wanna, I wanna know God and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, the closeness that we can have a relationship with Christ because more than death being defeated, this invitation to a a way of life is twofold. And I I wanna tell you these things right now. And one of them is the resurrection brings us life. Not just regular life. In the Greek language, it's called zoe life. It's a life that is full. Jesus, in John chapter 10, verse 10, he says, I've come that you might experience life and life to the full. He's talking about this Zoe life that there's obviously a heartbeat in your body or else you wouldn't be able to be tuning in to our online church today. There's you know blood circulating in your system. There's neurons firing in your minds and that's all signs that you're alive. But I can tell you story after story after story of people that were alive physically but dead spiritually. I call these people the walking dead. And we're not talking about the zombie kind. We're talking about how on the outside you would say, oh, you know, they're living life, you know, and they're experiencing life, but they're dead on the inside. Two guys in particular that I think of, uh, one of my friends, his name is Rob. And Rob had all the money. He had the popularity. He had the, the notoriety. He had a great business, multimillionaire. And all of this stuff that was happening in his life, you would say from one perspective, like he had it all. And in that space, he actually wanted to die. He found himself at the penthouse suite in one of the hotels in Vegas, wanting to throw himself out the window. Because even though he had the money, 
he had all of the pleasures of life that, that life could give you, he still wanted to die. Why? Because he was alive on the outside and dead on the inside. I want to introduce you to another friend of mine. His name is John L. John L. grew up in a very, very difficult upbringing. He went through 17 different group homes. He started out life with almost being sexually assaulted at a young age. And then through that, he got married at a young age because he got his girlfriend pregnant, wanted to do the right thing, started running with gangs, joined the East Side Crips. I mean, he, he was involved in situations that probably should be given him a life in prison sentence, if not the death penalty. But John L. found himself in a position that he was alive on the outside, but dead on the inside. And through a series of events, people in our church reached out to him one day as they were doing a faith walk and said, God sent us here. Our pastor said that we find a guy in the park with a red shirt on. Here you're in the park with a red shirt. You're the guy. And he was taken back by that. But through that situation, he made a decision to follow Jesus. And so did my friend Rob. Before he threw himself out that window, he made a decision to surrender to God and follow Jesus. And both those men, their lives were transformed. Their lives were changed. That Zoe that became available through the resurrection of Jesus got on the inside of them and they became alive. See, a lot of people think eternal life is talking about heaven. Let me tell you something. Jesus died to get you to heaven, but he resurrected to get heaven into you. And so heaven wants you. Heaven is calling you and heaven wants to live in you. And the only way that is possible is by you surrendering your life to Jesus. And as we're going to get to the end of this talk, and it, it, the, the Bible says that those who call on the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be saved. So the resurrection gives us life. It brings us life. The second thing I want to talk to you about is the resurrection brings us hope. And when I say the word hope, I'm not talking about the world's version of hope, which is wishful thinking. Like, I hope the Dodgers win the World Series this year. That's not the hope I'm talking about. The hope that I'm talking about is biblical hope. And the way the Bible defines hope is confident expectation. And what Jesus released in the open grave is the fact that hope is alive that every claim that Jesus made was validated by the empty tomb. A lot of other people have come through this world and, and come in times past, and they've made some crazy claims like Jesus, but none of them emptied the grave. And so by Jesus emptying the grave, what he did is he said, all the promises that I have said and I've spoken are yes and amen and are validated by the fact that the tomb is empty and that I'm alive. So because Jesus is alive, hope is alive. And Jesus says, I am going away to prepare a place for you in John 14. He says, I want you to be at peace to know that. And, and everything that Jesus said, I'm going to give you my helper that is going to live on the inside of you, that there is a, a better future for you. And some of you come from a bad past and you need to know that because of the resurrection, there is hope for you, that your best is yet to come. Type that out right now in that comment section and just declare it to yourself. My best is yet to come. How do I know that? Because you still have heaven waiting for you. Heaven is in the front windshield. It, some of you, this is a word for somebody. Stop looking in the rear view mirror of what has happened in your past and pay more attention to what's coming at you in your future. Because what's coming for you in your future as a follower of Jesus is resurrection power. And the resurrection power gives you a hope-filled future because you have heaven. You have all kinds of things. God is healing you of the brokenness of your past. God is, God is restoring the, the complications of present day relationships. That's all hope. And when God gets in your life, all bets are off because he can take the most broken situation and put it back together again. I like to say it this way. When Jesus meets you in your mess, three things are gonna take place. Your life is going to be changed. People are going to be healed. And your family is going to be restored. 
It's the easiest way I can communicate this. And I know, I'm talking to some of you, things are bad with a capital B. They're dark with a capital D. I know that, that you're like, pastor, you don't understand what I'm going through. I, I kind of do. Because even though I'm a pastor, that doesn't mean I was born with the Bible in my hand, okay? I'm a pastor with the past. I've been through some gnarly stuff myself, including handling the death of my older sister at the age of 10. I, I've walked people through some really, really difficult things. So I, I, I can't say maybe I know exactly what you're going through, but I do have an idea. And I want to declare to you that Jesus resurrecting from the dead proclaims to you, no matter how bad the badness is, no matter how dark the darkness is, God is greater than the badness. God is greater than the darkness because the tomb is empty and Jesus has conquered the grave. That's it. That's the Easter message in a nutshell. And, and I know some of you that are like, hey, I already knew all this. Well, hey, stay tuned. Next week, we're starting a brand new series. We're looking at the seven I am statements of Jesus and we're doing a tour through the gospel of John. It's gonna be one of the most epic talk series that we've ever done in the history of our church. So come back next week and we're gonna dive deep and we're gonna start, it just makes sense to me, we're gonna start with the biggest I am statement of them all, I believe, and that is Jesus saying, I am the resurrection and the life in John chapter 11. So stay tuned for more of that next week, come back, okay? But I wanna talk to those of you that may be watching right now. Life isn't making any sense and you've got the education, you've got the academia, you got the intellectualism, you're a smart guy, you're a smart girl. But there's something in you that is empty. Might I add, it feels dead. And there are a lot of mysteries surrounding this world. But here's a mystery that doesn't need to be a mystery for you anymore. And that is God came in the flesh as a man named Jesus and he lived a perfect sinless life so that by coming to this world and giving his life on the cross, that he could take your mistakes and my mess ups and he could take them all and absorb them all into himself and, and take on the wrath that we deserve from all of the things that we've done wrong in this world. And that through his death, we can be made right with God. But the story doesn't end on Friday with the crucifixion. The story progresses and it moves into the resurrection. So Jesus died so that you can be forgiven and he resurrected so that you can have life. And I wanna pray for those of you that right now, you know that, hey, God's talking to you. And I, I will tell you that my faith in Jesus has revolutionized everything in my life. It brought my family together. It, it really, honestly, my family should have been sunk like the Titanic after my sister tragically died. It, it should have happened. But you know how my family got through this? Because of Jesus. And neighbor came in and really loved us and through this whole process, man, everybody in my family, including yours truly here, became a follower of Jesus. And not only has he healed that, that hurt, but he's actually done incredible things. Uh, through that tragedy. And that's, that's really, think about what, what Easter is. It, it is the triumph over a tragedy. And when God gets in your life, he's able to take your tragedy and turn it into a triumph. He's able to take your mess and turn it into a message. That's, that's our God. He is the master of the turnaround. He can take the most ugly, vile situation and turn it around and flip it on its head and bring good out of the bad. I'm gonna end by encouraging you with this last scripture. It says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans chapter 10, verse 13. I, I will tell you that some of you haven't called on the name of the Lord. You haven't said, I wanna surrender my life to you, Jesus. I wanna be filled with your spirit. I want to know you, God, and the resurrection power and if you've never made that decision, I wanna pray with you right now in this moment to do that. So just right where you're watching, just pause, bow your head, close your eyes, and, and just pray this prayer after me. Say, Jesus, 
today I give you my life. I thank you for being willing to go to the cross and be crucified in a horrible, horrible death so that I could be made right and restored with God. And today, I thank you for the forgiveness of my sins, but I also thank you for the power of the resurrection that has allowed me to be filled with your spirit. So come live on the inside of me so that I may no longer be dead inside, that I may be fully alive in Christ. For today, I make a statement that I am a follower of Jesus and I belong to God. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, I want to encourage you to do one thing. Well, actually two things. First, let somebody know, maybe that lives with you or lives near you, that you made this decision. Maybe you're gonna text a friend. But two, I want you to text the word follow to the Atmos phone. And this is our way of being able to connect with you, make sure that you have a Bible, make sure that we can be praying for you and encouraging you in this new journey with Jesus that you are embarking on. So text the word follow to the number on your screen and maybe you can even do the little scan, the QR code, but we love you and we wanna end with one more worship song before we sign off. And hey, Jesus is alive. And this resurrection day is an invitation to your reborn, renewed life. Let's worship him. Thank you so much for tuning in today. We're so glad you joined us and we hope you have an amazing Easter. If we'd love for you to join us in person next week. For more information, check out atmosphere.church. Thanks, have a great day.